special episode more so because this is the first round table session for speaking territory and i'm very excited because we have two special guests with us so i'm sure it will be a very exciting episode but before introducing the guest i want to recap a little on the experience episode we did this week it was about bollywood as a soft power uh, very little is spoken of about how bollywood impacts and influences the geopolitical scenario we spoke about its hits and also about its missed opportunities and today we are going to dwell deep into that but before that let me introduce our panelist uh, mohammed al mulhim he's my classmate from the school of international relations and strategic studies university of mumbai we have harsh joining us from movie sense he is the curation head at movie sense movie sense is an online film theater platform that offers the opportunity to discover new films across several classical and emerging genres it is a view of friendly pack from with the support refund model and we have a special guest with us professor daya thisu he is a professor of international communication at the hong kong baptist university he was a distinguished visiting professor and inaugural disney chair in global media in beijing before joining hong kong baptist university he was a co-director of the india media center at the university of westminster in london he has done his phd in international relations from jnu and is the founder and managing editor of global media and communication a journal published by sage he has authored and edited as many as 17 books among his key publications are mapping breaks media media and terrorism global perspectives internationalizing media studies news as entertainment the rise of global infotainment media on the move global flow and contra flow international communication continuity and change third edition and electronic empires global media and local resistance in 2014 he was honored with a distinguished scholar award by the international studies association a first for a non western scholar in the field of international communication so it is a great honor to have you here thank you for joining us today so so thank you for inviting it's a pleasure thank you thank you so much so sir just to start the conversation and because it's a round table uh, conversation just to uh, dwell in a view point so we know that bollywood films evokes a lot of reaction not only the films but also music in particular because bollywood and musicality goes hand in hand and uh, today in the digitalized world we see how uh, there are social media reels where people from africa and other parts of the world lip sync to bollywood songs even though even though they don't understand the language necessarily and uh, you know in this digitalized world there's no more the excuse of language barrier anymore even though they don't understand it they just enjoy the music and go with it then there are a lot of youtube videos uh, in which they react they take a bollywood scene or a bollywood song and they give those reaction on what they think about those films and uh, whatever their viewpoint is regarding that and a lot of time there there are a lot of criticism but there are also a lot of positive remark and there is no doubt that uh, bollywood is kind of globalized there's so many actors who are like international faces they are brand ambassador ambassadors for different non actor states as well but somehow bollywood has restricted itself with the tag of entertainers or a tag like bollywood goes hand like if you speak about bollywood people speak about zumba or uh, if you uh, speak about bollywood they speak about yeah dancing is really nice it's very skillful the dancing so do you think that uh, that somehow bollywood could have done much more than just restricting itself with the tag of entertainers and this is the question to everyone okay um, i mean how she want to go first you you was um i don't i mean i don't mind who will want to go first or yeah, mohammed will go first i think i think you can kick in sir and i'll i'll follow up <laughs> okay because um i mean uh, simran when you introduced me uh, you didn't mention uh, i actually wrote uh, which is the first book on india's soft power I from buddhism to bollywood so i know book, 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 book like study which was yeah. published way back in 2013 the indian edition was published in 2016 
Um, the book is much more than about Bollywood. Uh, it's called Communicating India Soft Power, Utha to Bollywood. I'm glad to see Mohammed has his back, visual background is Buddha sitting there, the most uh, important figure to have emerged from India. And the ideas that he propounded are arguably the most enduring ideas that have come out from India. The global people know who Buddha is. So um, the book is much more, more than about Bollywood, but um, so the subtitle was Buddha to Bollywood. So I had a dedicated chapter on that book about Bollywood and especially its global presence. So um, the way you are defining it as a kind of pure entertainment. Um, I mean, after all, it's popular entertainment and popular entertainment popular cinema is primarily driven by entertainment. Um, and also given uh, the history of our cinema, and as you know, we have a very complex cinema landscape. Bollywood is one of the many cinemas that India has. Um, and Bollywood itself is actually an odd phrase because it was coined by a journalist in the city where you are sitting. Um, and it became a kind of catch you know, phrase and some people dislike it because it implies that it is a version of Hollywood, which uh, it is not. It is, it's, um, and it's not just because it has better dances, but it has a different grammar of cinema, a different culture of cinema. Um, so I would, uh, you know, when you say people say it is about dance, you, you know, you have to be specific which people you're talking about. Um, and this lip singing, you know, you mentioned this, uh, it was a very famous uh, case in Tanzania, I think it was, where this tall guy was singing to this, this sister, and then uh, apparently he was beaten up because some people didn't like his singing, and singing the song, singing the song, the foreign songs. So um, I would say that it is more than just an entertainment. And uh, if you, you know, I've been very privileged. I have worked in various parts of the world. I've traveled quite a bit. And um, one thing people associate India with is this kind of um, over-the-top, exaggerated, song and dance oriented cinema. Um, it doesn't matter whether you are in Russia or Egypt or, you know, uh, Malaysia. Um, that's something which is easily identifiable at a popular level, that this is the, you know, very, uh, some might say odd cinema, some might say distinctive. But, uh, so in terms of, you know, it's uh, identification with a, a distinctive kind of cinema. Uh, I think it, that's, uh, you know, well established. Um, there is no, uh, issue about that India is identified with this kind. As I said, I mean, if you think of the RRR, for example, this year, which has just broken every conceivable record, um, it's not a Hollywood film. It, you know, it comes from a different tradition. And <laughs> yeah, I was I was amazed by how much more exaggerated it was than the normal Bollywood film. So, uh, and, and hugely successful, at least 1,000 crores or something kind of money it has made, which is phenomenal, you know, and it's, it's trending on, uh, on Netflix, etc. So, um, the entertainment element is there, but there is much more to it, and probably we, we'll come back to that in our discussion. Mm -hmm. So, I'll, I'll stop there in that uh, moment. Uh, so I, I agree, Bollywood, as a neolism for Bombay and Hollywood, is a industry that goes way back and it's definitely more than what we think of like over the top cinema it's it's obviously over the top cinema but there is in the opinion parallel cinema movement there are a lot of things india indian films are known for their culture so if you see any representation of any indian character or indian landscape or anything you'll see the uh, international filmmakers or the foreign filmmakers pushing the culture of India at, a, at the top of all the films because they realize that India as a land is known for its culture. So, 
so uh, that is one of the films that one of the things that you'll see very purely being reflected in the foreign films uh mostly over the top cinema has been developed in a way it it has given us that the dance numbers and uh the songs and by the way we have very famous songs for example uh, mera juta hai japani the song in itself is one of the most played songs globally from india so there is some element to it that okay this and that's a pure representation of culture like it it's the song that talks about the even everything happens time still in india so that is the true representation of how indian cinema has been shaped over the years uh so what i believe is that indian cinema is currently undergoing a transition uh especially with the advent of the ott platforms and that coinciding with the pandemic which has seemingly changed the audience taste uh whether it's uh the cinema going experience or what they are watching at home and we can see how uh these are uh, two films which were these just this year kashmir files and bulbulaya too they are of such stark genres and yet both of them have earned a lot of money and both of them show uh, a certain aspect of indian culture for example kashmir files you see uh, kashmir in that bulbulaya too there's a lot of uh, bengali culture sprinkled in there and yet they are both distinctively indian uh, because india is not a monolith you have uh, tens of cinema industries you have bollywood in bombay you have uh, in the south you have four languages malayalam kannada tamil telugu then in bengal you have the bengali cinema industry uh, of which simran has uh, been a part of so uh we can see that uh, with the ott platforms and people spending much more time at home a lot of, uh i believe india had a chance to showcase and export this culture uh to the uh cinema uh watchers all over the world subtitles made that much easier there's this uh, quote by the director of parasite uh bong joon ho he says that uh, the link uh there's a 1 inch barrier between uh the english speaking cinema goers and foreign cinema which is this 1 inch barrier is the subtitle and uh we can see that now india is uh, beginning to uh, showcase this uh cinema and the culture through you have songs songs of indian classical music you have uh, costumes uh, you have traditional attires you have uh, sh- you are showing uh, films from the heartland uh, right to the urban centers showing the various uh, spectrum of india as a country and this has been a recent development and i believe that this turn uh, is certainly uh, changing the way the world is starting to perceive india as a country and the onus is on both the cinema makers and the cinema watchers to uh, be in sync with each other and uh this will organically develop with time and as the pandemic has settled we are seeing a certain direction where this has been going so but why do you think it took so much time for the viewers to like you uh, made two interesting point one is that of course because of pandemic people watch more of netflix and amazon and there has been a digitalized revolution which now bollywood is also following i will come to that but the other part that you mentioned about so many industries existing in india there's like tollywood kollywood kollywood sandalwood 
and bengali film industry i have been privileged to work there as well but uh, and india produces over an average of 1000 movies per year the thing is even though we produce 1000 movies per year the budget for each movie is much less of course there's exceptional cases like rrr or a kgf but you think that as an industry we should all come together we yet don't have a studio production we have uh, individual pro- production houses like dharma or yashraj producing these movies but we don't have a warner brother or a fox producing large scale movies so do you think this distinction which recently has been made more clear there has been a clarity of distinction because language took the new wave of conflict do you think at the time of the pandemic but like this is my view that the industry should come together india should be one narrative because whenever we say and an oscar nomination it's always from bollywood and we don't really think of the south industry so do you think there should be more collaboration in terms of indian cinema i think it should uh on i think i think that has been developed very far simple because in the recent years if you look at the past films being sent to oscar for even the films that won film like the national film awards there have been a lot of growth in terms of recognition for recognition for the south industry the south, or as in or even the asmis industries as well if you if you have mm-hmm. like looked in the recent past in the last 5 years asmis industries has grown a lot mm-hmm. and that means that uh this has like this this has been improving what i personally feel bollywood specifically to bollywood as a soft power there are two things that needs to be done first of all there needs to be a technological revolution like because we all know film making not only film making needs technology but distribution like it's an end to end thing so there has to be a technological revolution in india regarding films the second the government has to recognize this power of bollywood as a soft power because then only uh, they'll start thinking it from the perspective of okay how this can create an an image for india which is very very strong image because i'm not saying create any other joseph gobels who was the minister of propaganda for hitler <laughs> don't create another joseph but we need a person th- sitting behind and thinking because no matter how much we criticize triumph of the film triumph of the will was a very smart propaganda film and you could if you look at the film today you will realize that okay this this is how a propaganda film is made so the, that's very important a person needs to sit behind and the government needs to support bollywood in terms of thinking okay these are the culture that needs to go out and this is how others should perceive bollywood and in india so basically to push ahead the india's narrative can i add something yes. because some yes. very interesting points have been made both by mohammed and by harsh um first thing to say is the most celebrated film director from india worked in a regional language in bengal namely satyajit ray if you ask educated people around the world which film uh, director they know about from india is satyajit ray right and he worked under the kind of budgets that you and i cannot in you guys certainly can't imagine what the budget he was working under and the films are still i mean a few years ago uh, there was a retrospective of his films in the south bank in london and uh, i had two children and they both now grown up and they were so in the early university years we had never seen anything like that and i was constantly i was thinking well, the 1950s 1960s films of black and white you know these young people who are used to so much more material but they like it and they were just astonished at what they saw right so uh, i think that, that that's something very important to keep in mind that uh, apart from this uh, big budget entertainment oriented cinema there is also a very sophisticated tradition of very thoughtful films made in india not just in bengali there's a whole tradition of various languages um, kerala especially for its marathi films and everything even even hindi cinema is a tradition uh, quite serious uh, from Bimal Roy to I could go on. Um, so that's the first thing to say that you know, and, and the, 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 the um, point about um, 
what is the state doing to help? What is the government doing to help? Again, a bit of history is very important for youngsters uh, because um, have you ever wondered why is it that India has its own distinctive cinema? Despite the fact that when we were uh, given independence in 1947, we were a very, very poor country. Right? Um, one of the very important reasons, and why is it that many other countries which had thriving film industries, I mean, Indonesia, is, is think outside the Western world, so we always talk about in relation to the United States, it's a different category. Think about people like us. Where were we and what, you know? So um, look at their cinema today. Thailand had its industry, Egypt had a huge industry. They're eclipsed, they're taken over essentially. But in India, uh, there was and is a constant, partly it's the market, partly it's the diversity of India that you might be growing up with Tamil cinema and you don't bother about Shah Rukh Khan, you don't know who Shah Rukh Khan is, right? Uh, and that's perfectly okay. Um, so uh, I think. You know, one of the reasons was that the state, the government of the time of the government, was implicitly helping the industry. Why? It was helping because it realized this is an expression of India's culture. It is also a very important instrument for nation building. So if you think of the films in the early years of our independence, think of um, the Muslim character, how was the Muslim character portrayed in cinema in the 50s and 60s? It's always a very moral person, a very you know, committed person. And these were the films made by people, many of them, who had actually suffered the atrocities of partition. They were Punjabis, they were Bengalis, who had seen firsthand the, the, the horrors of that period. But you don't see that reflected in popular culture, in the popular cinema, right? Um, and also this idea of creating a, a, a nation, an idea of forging a kind. So people are singing, Mera Juta Hai Japani was mentioned, right? Um, that becomes an iconic song across the country. So, so there's that. And then also the state, what the state did was want to actually impose high uh, sorry, taxes and duties for foreign cinema. So Hollywood was not take, taking over India. For it, it was not important because it was a poor market. Although the scale was there, even at independence, we were 300 million people. It's a huge market. Um, and there was an English speaking elite. We were familiar with Western culture. So, you know, I mean, the elite at least was. So there was, the, it should have been a, a very obvious market to take over. So, it, you know, it, so by, by having heavy uh, duties and taxes for foreign films, um, and the most important thing was the, the print, you know, the, the, in which they actually produced film, that, that was very, that was important. And the government would subsidize that. And therefore, uh, although the quality was brilliant, if you look at old films, although now they've been digitized, you know, I'm old enough to remember the originals. <laughs> They were not very good quality because it was, you know, we had very few resources. But the intent was there that we got to protect and promote our culture, our city. And there was, uh, not just at, at, at this more popular level, but the same thing applied to regional cinema across the country. So I think that's very important to remember. And also something even deeper, which is a cultural thing that, you know, they're very, a country where the elite spoke English, which was for 200 years part of the British imperial uh, connection. Um, uh, you know, why is it that we retain that link with our languages and our culture? It's in, and as I was saying earlier about the partition and the aftermath and how that was represented, in, in cinema. it was only in 1971 that they made this film called Garam Hawa, which is one of the finest film made anywhere in the world. Uh, they took this head on, this this uh, theme. Before that, it was played in a very, very subtle way. Uh, uh, if you contrast that, what is happening today is it's, it's quite a kind of a crude representation of the complexities of, of society. 
So I think popular cinema, with all its limitations, was, in my view, was able to help, in, in my view, actually considerably in creating a popular nation-building uh, kind of theme. That we are all Indians, we might have different religions or castes or, or you know, we speak different language, but we are part of this big thing called India. And as uh, some people have argued that Lata Mangeshkar and Amitabh Bachchan have done more to unite our country than all those committees created by the government to promote, uh, you know, language or culture. Or so you uh, spoke about Satyajit Rai, and yes, he was a globalized star. He also got the recognition, but it was in that decade that directors like Rishikesh Mukherjee and Basu Chatterjee, uh, their cinema referred to as middle of the road cinema by creating wholesome, feel good movies. But these movies were ignored by the Western, and they weren't recognized in comparison to Satyajit. Rai's movie, who, who, was con who concentrated on India's uh, poverty. So, and uh, also to uh, quote you, you wrote that, uh, you wrote in your book about the soft power that the US largely runs the show because of its media dominance. So it has been a decade. So do you think that that viewpoint has changed? And do you think that uh, Joseph Nye's statement that conceptualization of soft power cannot be divorced from the US foreign policy agenda and its implementation? Still holds true. See, the, the concept of soft power itself is quite a kind of muddled concept. Um, it's interesting when this was actually introduced. It was introduced in 1990 as Cold War was coming to an end. Um, and it came from a professor who was also uh, act actively involved in US policy making. He worked with both um, Clinton. And um, so, so he, he was part of two administrations at a senior level. So he had insight into the policy making project. So it's just to be seen within that context. Um, and, you know, US has had a very, very important role in terms of uh, popular entertainment. You know, some people have argued it was uh, Hollywood and Harvard which actually won the Cold War. It wasn't all these nuclear weapons and, and military strength. Uh, and there is some 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 grain of truth in that argument. Um, so it's also an indication of how the rest of the world operates that this idea of soft power became a kind of very sexy idea. Everybody was using it without really, uh, you know, kind of concretizing it what it actually means. Um, and if you look at the literature, academic literature or policy literature since then, this book was published, uh, there are dozens and dozens of uh, books and journal articles and policy reviews about this idea of soft power. Um, and popular cinema is just one part of this much bigger cultural diplomacy project, right? Uh, education is another very important. I think I mentioned Harvard and Hollywood connection in the case of the United States. So the reality is that the United States, uh, you know, even in 2022, continues to dominate the discourse because it has uh, formative power. Um, just look at your own television channels. I mean, I, I study these things, so I watch it, and thanks to the technology, you can watch it and eventually. Um, when they are talking about non-Indian cinema. What cinema are they talking about? What celebrities are they talking about? In nine out of ten cases, we're talking about Hollywood. There might be an exception, some British person or some, you know, like Parasite makes a big news because it wins an award in uh, it wins an Academy Award. Otherwise, we wouldn't know even where South Korea is, let alone what kind of cinema it produces. So I think that's the thing one has to keep it. So why does that happen? Because the system is such. The system is still very much controlled by certain parts of the world. And it's not just about our cinema. If I ask you, uh, name one Turkish actor, or a Russian director, or an Iranian writer, or a Japanese photographer, filmmaker, you wouldn't know. And I blame you. I wouldn't know. Right? So I think that's what uh, 
when you look at in that context and see what we have achieved, that we still able, or without, or despite all this pressure, we were able to retain a certain distinctiveness in our cinema. Even today, you have a big budget film with at least, you know, five or six songs. Although the quality of writing and the music is arguably declined, but you know, it is a still integral part of it. So it's, what I was saying earlier, it's a different grammar of cinema. Right? It's a different culture of cinema. And when you start using, uh, you start making kind of derivative cinema, which is that you watch, you know, you watch it with a successful American uh, series, and so now can be adapted to a situation. Uh, it works within a certain demographic, but it doesn't reach the, the Kaspar level, the village level, because where there is the, you know, the biggest audience. And also, uh, you know, if you're thinking of uh, OTT was mentioned before, so obviously, um, you know, Sacred Games, for instance, was uh, noticed internationally. It was much more successful. Uh, but if you watch it, I watched some of it, and it's still very much, the, the sensibility is very Western. And although the context is Indian, right? Um, and similarly, uh, other, there are several other things since then. We now talk about OTT platforms, which are, uh, in my view, still kind of, they're thinking, obviously, how can we reach a, a wider audience, right? One of the interesting things about Indian cinema was that because of its huge uh, domestic audience, it could afford to ignore what the international audience thought of it, right? It was one of the reasons why it's in some ways it's very, you know, kind of inward-looking thing, because it had a huge audience. You didn't have to worry about uh, international so, in terms of its global presence, in terms of the soft power context, uh, you know, I would argue that we have actually, although we are known more, but we have lesser influence than we had in the early years of independence. For very clear political reasons. So, if you think about the work, how the world was after the Second World War, so it was a Cold War world. So large parts of the Soviet Union and the Soviet allies, as well as China, could not watch American entertainment. It was banned in many parts. So how much of the state propaganda you can watch, right? The workers are great and peasants are great. That's what the, the Russians and the Chinese were doing. So then comes this Raj Kapoor kind of cinema, which is broadly progressive, but has a song and dance, has a story, you know, and in the end, the, 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 the earnest guy, the guy from the village, the, the large hearted and the honest guy wins, right? So it is a socialistic kind of uh, message in it. And that's also true in, in a large part of developing world. Uh, in, uh, even in countries where they have their own cinema, Egypt, for instance, um, so I think it was much because people could identify with that. And if you, you know, bring it to, to the more contemporary period, just look at what kinds of films have done well in China, which is the major market. But these are very Indian themes, whether it is Dangal or whether it is English medium or whether it is a super, uh, say, what was superstar. <laughs> Or Toilet, a Prem Katha, does very well in China, because despite its massive progress, it, it, it is, there's a generation in China which remembers that open defecation was a reality, as it is in India today. Right? Nothing to do with the West. In West, they would not watch that film. So what, how can you have a film which is the toilet in the title? But in China, it did well. So I think also we need to think about anything else. Soft power, we should be obsessed with how the white man sees it or white woman sees it. We have to see in this broader world and actually in the 50s and 60s from Turkey to Indonesia to China uh, to cross the Soviet Union, actually uh, the, the, our films were widely watched and appreciated. Um, and, and of course, in parts of Africa, there has been a decline because the world has opened up in People have so much choice, but at the same time, um, it's also um, 
You know, the cinema has evolved in India. They're making, as I said earlier, they're making all kinds of films. And increasingly, the younger generation, the harshest kind of uh, people, are thinking of how will this film work in the Brazilian market or the Russian market. Or, uh, because there are certain stories which cut across, uh, you know, different cultures. So we got to get used to having a, 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 a central character who is not a Caucasian white middle class person. Uh, is from southern India, is a darker complexion person, or it is from northeast India, or you know, and and I think so. It's the soft power is, in my view, you know, um, although it's not as big as the inter cinema as big as it was, but I see a lot of possibilities uh, where it can actually be streamlined and uh, technology provides that that's, that possibility. Yes, and that like what you said about America and Harvard, it's very true because even people wants to go to Ivy League or have hamburgers, wear jeans because that is how they establish like they establish it as the the dream college. Like Ivy League should be the dream college, and that is how they uh, narrate it through movies. And uh, yeah, even in um, American movies, it's always the American superheroes who are established as the good guys. They are. The one saving the world from an alien, or uh, saving the world from Japanese army or Hitler. So I think their portrayal, they have been, I think, very also smart because they have been tuning with the geopolitics, and uh, it's been catering to the world. Because a five-year-old, six-year-old will always want to watch a superhero movie. So I think they have been very, very smart on when to produce what kind of cinema. And that has also boosted their tourism in a way. Like people want to go to Miami and like want to shop or go to USA. My dream country is USA. Why? For what? They don't have like people without any background in international relations think of USA as like we should ape to the Western culture to develop. Because while researching for the explainers, I was going through a lot of public forum where people have the thought process of aping to the Western culture or the American way of living. Wearing jeans, having hamburgers. Like I didn't know that it's such a big cult. When I started researching about it, I recognized and realized that how it influenced people, how the movies influence people. So, like to conclude with it, I also want to ask Harsh and Mohammed about what they think of the American way of living and is it changing or is America smarter in the way of how they produce contents that it caters. To everybody, and it caters universally. Um, what I believe is that uh, in the, uh, America, because of the pervasiveness of the English language, has uh, made it easier for people worldwide to uh, watch those films. It's made it more accessible because. A lot of people are still averse to subtitles. I have a few friends who are averse to that. And once we get through that language barrier, uh, we might uh, see a shift in that. Now, in terms of uh, filmmaking stories, the narratives that have been portrayed, uh, India is, in fact, one of the very few countries where the indigenous cinema industry uh, churns out much more revenue uh, than Hollywood films do in those markets. For example, in countries, in uh, certain African countries, certain European countries, you have Hollywood uh, always outgrossing uh, the films uh, that are indigenous to those countries. So, uh, I feel we must uh, take this to our strengths. We must not strive for Western validation because in the pursuit of Western validation we, validation, we might end up losing our roots which make Indian films quintessentially Indian. You know, we should uh, stick to our strengths. We should uh, uh, keep to our roots and uh, thus uh, if we are authentic in our portrayal uh, of 
cinema, the audience uh, will accept it, whether it's in India or worldwide. And uh, now the Indian diaspora, which is 18 million in number, is the world's largest. And these uh, people have been uh, vassals in a way for exporting and showcasing this culture to uh, the Western countries. Uh, and That's I believe, yeah, uh, so I believe that uh, in terms of uh, plot, uh, stories, narratives, we should uh, keep uh, it uh, Indian still. Whether that's South Indian, North Indian, Bengali, Maharashtrian, uh, wherever that is, as long as it's true in heart uh, and authentic, people will accept it. And it can resonate. Uh, for example, you have the urban genres, people will, uh, some segments of the society will empathize with that. Uh, and some people will be interested in the Indian culture in the heartland. Personally, I was unbeknownst to how the heartland is in particular, and now with films like Gangs of Vasepur, I have been uh, seeing, I've been seeing that aspect of it. Not aping to the Western culture, in short. Like we should like, went in that boundary and that diversification that okay, we are diverse, yeah. our cinema is different and it's fine, right? Yeah. No. Unless you want to add anything. We also said that language is an important thing, that's why maybe the American film has worked well. But does it stand the same for the South Korean industry? And why is it doing so well? Uh, apart from language, I'd like to add that there is one very important factor that needs to be there as well, which is a strong distribution market. So if we go way back in Hollywood, the distribution market of Paramount Pictures, 1913 is the founding year, Warner's Brothers, 1923. So these distribution market goes way back and India is very new in terms of distribution markets. And if you look, for example, Mohammed said Gangs of Worshippur. If I tell you the story of Gangs of Worshippur, Gangs of Worshippur is released in America as one film, in India as two films, in Brazil as a series of eight films, like eight yeah. It is cut down into parts of eight films. So this needs a very strong distribution market that needs to plan out how is the film supposed to release in a particular geography so that it fits and cultivates the best profits. Because if you would have launched Gangs of Vasipur as one film in India, it wouldn't have worked. No, first of all, no theatre will allow you to play it. If the theatre allows it, nobody has the patience to go sit in five hours and like watch a film. These geographies and these Details needs to be considered when distributing a film. So one of the key things in American film market is that their film bazaars are very strong. Our film bazaars are st strongly growing. I, I, I'll be going maybe in, in the next coming two months to the film bazaar in Goa happening. And I'll try to find more on this. But the film bazaars need, are a rec very recent phenomena in India. While uh, in like the Paramount Pictures and all these studio system goes way back. And as Dayas have said very rightly, the inward looking cinema, it has been a very inward looking cinema and that has been working very perfectly because Bollywood is still, not just Indian cinema, Bollywood is still produces one of the most films, like the most films are produced by Bollywood, it is the second largest viewership market, just by marketing it in India itself because there is so much crowd in India to watch the film. And if you look at the years, it has been working very nicely. For example, if you look from 1950 to 1960s, you'll see films like Mother India. You'll see films like Purabar Pashim in 1960s and 70s because that was what was needed. You needed people to see your culture and you needed people to uh, go away and move away from that freedom zone. But then came films like Divar, a rebellious cinema. Then if you look at 1990s and like the 2000s and 2005, then came a need for people to go back to experience that richness of the life but from Mahuna. You look at the lavish colleges that Shah Rukh Khan and all these are studying in. And uh, then then there came Bhagwan, films like who remind you of 
your roots to the Indian a film like Bhagwan won't work in American culture at all or in any culture that the third world countries relate to India because of films like these which has like strong family roots strong moral roots moral values so yeah that's true this is why films like I am maybe I'm not saying the right name but it's Naman, Namaste London right which ah, Akshay Kumar uh, you see an, um, a family living in London but they have uh, the, the family structure plays a very important dynamic in the whole film Namaste London so and if you recently so see India might be getting its first well packed very good sci-fi film in terms of dramas so the sci-fi phenomena is now coming to India so we are growing and we are a little bit late in comparison of American film industry in all aspects but yeah we are, try, we are trying to catch up and I think that is a very important thing yeah the growing need of VFX and all that can I just add one or two points about very interesting uh, conversation um, about where the cinema is going? Um, I think the the professionalization or corporatization of cinema, like any industry, is fundamental, and it's worth remembering. It was only in when Mr. Vajpayee was the Prime Minister of India, yeah. not long ago, when the industry was given the status of the industry, which meant that producers could actually go to a bank and say, I'm going to make this film, can I get some loan for it? Prior to that, it was dodgy money, right? And I mean, that part of the dodgy money continues to be integral to the uh, entertainment industry. But again, in terms of context, let's not forget that Hollywood grew uh, in the 1920s and 30s on the prohibition money. There was the, you know, the, in, in the, that period, there the, liquor was not allowed so they were making a lot of, a lot of black money and that money was feeding uh, Hollywood cinema um, and also I think it's very important uh, to kind of so that, that the, the, the policy change that this is a proper industry so when you think of the soft power argument that what's the government doing to promote its popular culture globally the Americans were doing it before the second first world war Right? And when Europe was a mess, because it had two world wars, it had Holocaust, the American cinema grew up and then it first it took over Europe and then it went all over the world. With very active support from the State Department and the government and private money. So for, uh, and it's interesting, I think Mohammed mentioned how uh, the, the box office in India is still very much Indian dominated. The only other country which has this case is the United States, where 90% is for Hollywood film, 10% for subtitled films. Right? Yes. India is really a remarkable case that even in this time and age, the vast majority of box offices was films made in India, whatever language these films are made. And it is no coincidence that the big Hollywood companies are investing in India. So, Dangal, the great Indian film, was actually fun, produced by Disney. Right? And, and all, many of the films, big budget films, are now, the money is American. Right? Because they realize, okay, you can't show your stuff, so why don't you just make them some? Uh, and and you know, this is a very basic uh, sort of economic argument. But I think it's, uh, it's important that the, this professionalization, that the, the, the technically the Indian films today are comparable to the best, best in the world, I'm less sure whether thematically or in terms of the, what might be called the soul of the, the film, uh, it is as good as it was. So you mentioned Rishikesh Mukherjee earlier. So even now, if you watch a Rishikesh Mukherjee film, you know, it was made in a very small budget in a very different time. You can relate to the characters. The writing is phenomenally good. The songs are pleasant. There's not even a single scene which jars. You can watch it with family. I don't think you can say that about a lot of films today. And I wonder, so I, I was at this great privilege once to talk to a very well-known uh, film writer in London. I used to be associated with the India Media Centre. We did some event and this very famous writer was there. And I asked him, I said, why is it that we're using those four-letter words in our dialogue today? 
I said, that's how people speak, he said. But then I said, but in the 70s, 60s, did the criminals use Sanskritized Hindi or very polished Tamil or, or other log Bengali, right? They spoke the same language. They spoke the, you know, what would be called four-letter words. But there was a thing, you know, we don't want to, we don't want to define our social conversation. We don't want our kids to learn these awful words, right? So I think there is this cultural shift also in terms of the soul of the, the, the writing, the soul of the In my view, very derivative, which is essentially coming from uh, bad American cinema, not even good European cinema or, or Japanese cinema or Iranian cinema, which is a tragedy because we have the talent, we have a whole, the Mohammed was saying, a whole tradition of storytelling. Right? If you look at Indian history, the, you know, the novels, the prose came to India much later when the Europeans came. All our grunts, all our philosophy, poetry is in verse. It is not in prose, right? So we have this very wonderful tradition and it's a, it's a pity that we are now becoming increasingly... Uh, I can see the argument because they want to say, so, okay, let's get beyond the Indian market. And, uh, but Again, from experience, I can tell you, I know, uh, uh, Mohammed mentioned uh, diaspora actually is bigger than what he, the figure he put, it's uh, nearly 30 million today, it's the, it's the second largest of the Chinese one, but it is the largest English-speaking diaspora in the world, right? So there is a certain affinity with that language, because wherever you're working, of course, you speak your Tamil or Bengali or whatever the Kashmiri or your first language is, but your working language is English. And therefore, um, when these, um, the OTT platforms are thinking of an Indian-themed uh, project, they're also thinking of these 30 million people. Many of them have the kind of money that is, you know, and that sort of sustains this kind of stuff. Um, so I think that, uh, again, you know, I, in the book I mentioned earlier, I have a whole chapter about diaspora of uh, how important it is for uh, creating a. So when I'm speaking at a, you know, at a conference or a young lecture, my, uh, who I am is you know, my identity, the first identity is this, oh, we had an Indian professor. Whether she was ugly or she was a shrewd caste or she was from, you know, Tamil Nadu or Bengal, doesn't matter. The secondary tertiary identity, first identity is that. So uh, if you go to Ivy League University in the United States and you see the you know, top professor is actually of Indian origin and she's top of her game. Right? So it's okay, these guys must be okay. Right? Uh, and I'm very proud to say that I'm entirely educated in India, from schooling to PhD and, and you know, we had very good education. You know, a much maligned university where I spent many years in Delhi gets very bad press these days in India. But actually, you know, there's, there's very good people there. And you go around the world, you meet them. They're pretty good people. What were they doing? You know? So I think it's, um, we, we need to kind of connect with that. It's because, you know, for popular culture, you need some intellectual and cultural grounding. So why don't we have a Shailendra today? What will happen when Guzar is gone? Who is going to replace him? Who is going to write that poetry, that dialogue? Right? The dialogues we are, it's just a banal day-to-day -day dialogue. The romance has disappeared from our cinema. It's, it's much more, you know, kind of WhatsApp kind of conversation. So, it's, you know, I mean, you might say, well, this happens from Tahir, so we need to move the time. But uh, there are certain things which I think uh, is an underlying continuity, cultural continuity. Is, I said the soul of the country or the country is very important. I, think I say that deliberately for young people because I think you guys have to uh, be very conscious of that and say, well, this, this is us, this is distinctive. And it doesn't mean that it has to be in opposition to something, right? I mean, in, in our tradition, we respect everything. So it's a good Korean cinema, why not? We may, we may not like their excessive violence, but you know, it's a different kind of cinema. So as you said that popular culture need intellectual people. So today we were actually honored to have you and have this uh, discussion with you. We are actually running short of time, so we have to conclude this. But again, we will again request you to join us and to have an interview so that we can dwell into, uh, as we touched Indian diaspora, maybe we can 
uh, dwell into diaspora or journalism or press. There's so much to talk about, about uh, source of soft power. So we will have you again. Uh, hope uh, you enjoyed the discussion with Harsh Mohammed and me. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, sir. Thank you. thank you so much and all the best for this podcast. Very good idea and keep it going. Very thank you. That I was able to learn with. Bye. All the best. Take care. Yes. Thank you.